Okay, so I think you're seeing the, the screen now. We're gonna talk, as Ava said, about um, youth-specific psychosocial interventions. In particular, we're going to talk about a number of um, interventions that are being developed, some are being implemented already, in the context of a Health Canada-funded project, which is the development of a comprehensive suite of uh, e-mental health <coughs> services for university students. This work is part of, <coughs> excuse me, my work uh, at the Mental Health Systems and Services Laboratory in the, at the University of British Columbia and the World Health Organization, World Mental Health Service Initiative, um, based at Harvard Medical School. So as I mentioned, this, uh, this work that you're going to hear about today is part of a four years, a multi-site uh, project funded by Health Canada. Um, it's a competitive grant uh, funded by the Substance Use uh, and Addictions Program. Um, and uh, it, it has three components. First, a screening component. This screening, online screening component is a trend study. A trend study is basically a repeated series of cross-sectional surveys uh, that we send weekly out to a random stratified sample of university students. And that gives us a very nuanced um, uh, picture of the uh, needs of the population and how those needs evolved. And as you will see later, that allows us to define what interventions are needed for that population. It also allows us to detect specific uh, high-risk uh, users, users, or, I mean, or, or respondents in this case, um, and then do something about that, as you will see uh, in, in the third component, which is the integration with health system. So first component, online screening. Second component is an online intervention that we are co-developing with students and which we will test through a randomized control trials, uh, trial. And in this case, our uh, app is being co-developed by, uh, by the research team, uh, student advisory committee, and the research team um, includes uh, about 10 students on staff that uh, lead or co-lead several components of the, of the development. And as I mentioned, it will be evaluated through an RCT uh, of an adaptive step care intervention. Uh, this means that I will say a little bit more later, but basically uh, the, the intervention will have several components and then will also uh, have different levels of uh, resource uh, uh, intensive, uh, different levels, uh, each of which has a different uh, level of research requirements, depending on the needs of the, of the student. And the third part is the integration with existing health systems. Um, I'm a, a health systems researcher um, and psychiatrist uh, and, and clinical psychologist by training, but my goal is to develop projects that are not so much um, um, just academic research, but that can actually contribute to how services are delivered in the real world, which is why uh, I've worked, we've worked very closely with, um, with uh, administrators at UBC and, and SFU and, and other universities to integrate uh, the tools with the services they offer. And I'll say a little bit more about that, uh, that late. So we have a number of protocols that we co-develop with the health services. And also, we provide facilitated access to care for people at high risk. So, the first uh, the first period, approximately between August of last year and January of this year, was stakeholder engagement. Um, there's a lot uh, of work to be done in uh, adapting our ideas, our research ideas, to uh, the real world, to the implementation um, in a, in an actually uh, existing and functioning institution, such as a university, which leads to, um, which leads to a, a process of change, both for the project and for the organization itself. It was a very, um, uh, it was a fundamental part of the, of the development. And as you will see, the project changed uh, significantly because of this 
this engagement. We launched the weekly online screening at GBC in early February, and then quite recently, uh, uh, so early February at UBC and uh, recently at SFU, and we're still um, in the implement or, or rather the launching phase at uh, McMaster and the University of Toronto. We have already about 4,000 respondents um, that are representative of the, the student population of UBC and uh, adding now uh, SFU students who will be representative of the SFU population. Interestingly, when we designed this study, um, this weekly design, uh, it was the first time we did it as part of the collaboration with, with the World Mental Health Service Initiative. And the reason we did that is when we designed uh, the study in, in September of last year, we thought that it would be uh, an interesting way, an interesting variation from the usual cross-sectional that you do just once. You send the email uh, to every student and then you get a response rate and it's, it's done. And we said, well, if we do it weekly, we will be able to catch uh, external uh, shifters or external exposures that may happen. We were thinking at the time, things like uh, uh, the, 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 the wildfires in the summer or the or a terrorist attack or, or things that may affect students uh, um, uh, mental health or, 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 or well-being and then COVID hit and so we were able to, uh, to we had a, a, a tool in place that allowed us to track how COVID um, uh, got closer to campus spread throughout and then and then receded and now we are tracking the second wave. <clears throat> Um, and as I said, we are uh, ongoing at UBC and SFU and uh, in, on the launching phase at McMaster, which should start any day now, and the University of Toronto. So um, how do we do the online screening? We invite uh, students with an email, 350 students, we remind them a couple of times, then we close that uh, um, let's say easy to reach uh, survey, and we actually select a, a random subsample of the non-responders. And for those that we have a phone, we call them and explain why it is important to get the non-respondents um, uh, responses in order to increase the validity of our overall results or send them a personalized email. And then um, we, 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 uh, we close the, the survey seven days later. And as I said, um, we, well, we, we've had a very good response rate with that strategy. Uh, more than 50% of the people who we actually reach on the phone uh, complete the survey. Uh, the overall weighted response rate based on this sampling strategy is about 40%, which is unheard of in this, in this type of, of uh, studies. So it was a very effective outreach method. Uh, so what I'm gonna tell, what I'm gonna tell you about now, and, and this is basically a very nimble um, uh, uh, a very nimble uh, tool that is made available because of how uh, easy it is to deploy online screening tools. It's, 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 it's an ongoing process that once it is launched, it can be maintained with very little cost and, and gives you an unparalleled uh, insights into, uh, into, into student or, or whichever population we're talking about uh, uh, well-being, mental health, and, and how the, the trend in those aspects uh, evolves. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about anxiety and depression in, in students during the first wave of the pandemic, that is approximately between uh, March and, and, and July. Um, as I mentioned, we do this repeated uh, uh, cross-sectionals. Um, and the exposure variable that we're going to talk about is what we call proximity of COVID-19 case. Uh, we asked the student, do you know someone who tested positive for COVID-19 uh, globally, but not in Canada, in Canada, but not in Vancouver, in Vancouver, in your uh, course or in your uh, home? And then we uh, run a number of regressions to understand how um, that exposure impacted uh, student mental health, particularly symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, by the way, not anxiety disorder or depressive disorder, but just symptoms. This can be perfectly normal or healthy um, um, responses in, 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 in the face of such a, 
a dramatic um, um, stressor. And as I said, the, the 30 day symptoms screen with the CD, the composite international diagnostic interview, which is part of the, of the uh, survey that we use. So this is how uh, the cases of, of COVID uh, got close to campus. During week four of the survey, we detected the first person who knew a, a positive test. And as we see first, mostly were not in Canada, but they were globally, then in Vancouver, then increasingly, I'm uh, sorry, um, globally in Canada, in Vancouver, um, in your course and at home. And then it, it sort of stabilized uh, around week 10. Um, and in, by week 13, the, the first wave was over and uh, restrictions on business operations had been uh, removed or most restrictions, even though uh, for university students, it was still, and it's still a distant learning. So the other thing we, we saw is um, how did the pandemic affect uh, the emotional well-being of students? About 20% were not affected, about half were affected, but able to manage um, about 17 were overwhelmed, but able to get help. And then there's a 10% of people who were overwhelmed and unable to find help. And this speaks of a, of a need for additional services and outreach. What we're going to see now is how, do, how does this proximity of COVID-19 affect uh, anxiety and depression? Uh, and uh, we'll see different models, univariable, multivariable, and, and multivariable with interactions. Um, and uh, we're going to see uh, a, a number of, of, of covariates there. Uh, there are more, we, we run more covariates even, but this is any anxiety or depression uh, um, in university students. And what, we, what we're going to focus on is this, this, this line here, uh, this line here know someone who tested positive for COVID-19. And it, it, is a, it involves a 13 percentage point increase on the probability of having anxiety or depression. These are percentage points. If we think of uh, the uh, uh, percentage increase, it's actually larger because the baseline for any symptoms of anxiety and depression is about 75%, if I remember correctly. And so this is actually like an 18% increase in the uh, probability of anxiety or depression uh, if you know someone who tested positive. Now, the interesting thing is what you will see uh, here in this, let me see one thing, oh yeah. So if we focus on anxiety, because what we know is that what we saw is that the significant effect was at the expense of anxiety, not of depression. And the interesting thing is that in the multivariate model with all with this and many other uh, covariates uh, controlling for, for confounding, et cetera, uh, we saw an increase in the uh, overall anxiety, right? But then when we uh, interacted the, the exposure variable with agenda, meaning, uh, you know, asking the question, is gender a, 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 a factor that interacts with the exposure to get the results? We actually see that this increase of 11 uh, percentage points is actually an average between small increases in anxiety in females and large increases in anxiety in males. Being female, as we see here, has a protective effect on the, um, on the, uh, respond, the anxious response to COVID. This doesn't mean that uh, women are less anxious. As you can see here, uh, uh, women have a higher baseline anxiety, 14 uh, percentage points higher, 11 percentage points in the, in the multivariate model. They have higher baseline anxiety, but the response of COVID in males is much higher than in women. And this is uh, an interesting uh, finding that hasn't been pointed to in, in other studies. Um, another thing that we did, this was led by Laura Jones, um, a, a medical student. Um, we looked at the, um, at the adherence to Canadian low risk guidelines uh, for cannabis and alcohol uh, uh, use um, in, in, in university students. And what we, well, you know, the, the methods are what, what I just explained. This is based on, on about 2,600 responses. Uh, what we can see here is basically this on the top here, we have the low risk uh, uh, cannabis uh, uh, guideline adherence and the low risk alcohol guideline adherence. Uh, what we see is that 
with respect to cannabis, 62% of students adhere to all guidelines. Um, uh, interestingly, um, the, the, there's one, one criteria which is overly stringent and many people do not adhere to, which is that you should, the only way to abstain, to, to avoid any risk is to abstain from using. And, uh, you know, there's about 40% of students who have used at some point, um, but the adherence to, to most of the others is, is quite high. Uh, and with respect to alcohol, and this is uh, another very, very interesting uh, uh, finding, which is that only 45% of students approximately adhere to all uh, low risk guidelines, as we can see here, but the, the, the adherence to, for example, uh, limits on the overall weekly consumption or not driving or operating machinery is very high. The one that is, has low adherence is the binge drinking, right? It's, it's the, on one occasion, drinking more than three uh, drinks if you're a woman, four drinks if you're a man. And that is uh, uh, what, what's being problematic in university students, not the rest. And that allows us to uh, target uh, uh, and to, to develop um, uh, population-specific interventions, and we will, as we will see uh, later. So this is uh, the predict. These are the predictors of high-risk consumption of cannabis and alcohol. And basically, what we see there is that uh, ethnicity, gender, the degree, uh, the student type, um, sorry, um, um, uh, and the housing situation. Uh, is a predictor uh, for our predictors for high risk consumption, um, as you can see here. Um, you know, in this case, the the the, the white uh, students are the the ones that uh, have increased odds of of, uh, of of being above the low risk guidelines. Um, um, again, being male, um, and uh, for example. Uh, living on your own or in a, in a shared in a shared uh, apartment or in a, a frat house increases your likelihood as one could can imagine but we see the the evidence checks checks that okay um, another thing that we were able to do uh, thanks to this uh, study so by the way the the alcohol and cannabis consumption did not were not as impacted by by the proximity of covid based on on some um, preliminary analysis we haven't than a formal analysis yet, but um, it doesn't seem to, to affect it that much. What we're going to see now is how do mental health problems and substance use problems co-occur in university students? This is an analysis led by Richard Montali, our data analyst, and then by our, our team, we have a very large team. This is a Latin class analysis um, that looks at a co-occurrence of uh, anxiety, depression, uh, cannabis use above low risk guidelines, alcohol use above low risk guidelines, any opioid use and uh, non-prescription stimulant use in university students. The, 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 why, the reason why we use Latin class analysis is that it allows you to uh, look at your data and basically uh, see how uh, individuals uh, are grouped in the data itself uh, based on uh, specific uh, outcome uh, variables and, and how the, um, the, the, the other variables uh, behave. And then you can, uh, you can run regressions and, and try to see what predicts uh, people's belonging to all of these classes. Um, as I said, we can then use the Latin classes as an outcome and run regressions to understand uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, predicts your, your risk of being in, in each class. So basically, what we see there um, in, in this, this, uh, this lines, these curves represent the level of anxiety, depression, cannabis, alcohol, opioid, and stimulants here. Um, and each line is a different uh, uh, class, a different Latin class, meaning uh, the, the students, all of the students uh, in, in our study are sorted out in one of these four classes. Um, one class, class one in green here, is low symptoms of anxiety and depression. And then again, this is a very low threshold. This is any symptoms of anxiety and depression because we didn't want to focus on people with disorders necessarily, but on people with uh, any anxiety or depression. So low, low, and also low cannabis, 
relatively low alcohol, low opioid use, and low stimulant use. So this is what we call a low, low category, low mental health risk, low substance use risk. Then we have a class two, we have high, very high, 100%. This is the percentage uh, of people in the class who have whichever problem. In this case, 100% have anxiety, 100% almost, 98 have depression, 85% use cannabis above the low risk guidelines, 92% use alcohol above the low risk guidelines and very high uh, uh, any opioid use, 30% have some opioid use and 20% have uh, a non-prescription non uh, stimulant use. So high, high. Then we have high, low, high mental health concerns, low comparatively uh, uh, substance use, and then low, high, low mental health concerns, high alcohol and, 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 and other substance uses. And if we look at the prevalence of these classes, what we see is that as we, as we could uh, expect to some extent, um, um, the, the most prevalent class, 45% of students belong to class three. Class three is high mental health concerns, meaning any symptoms of anxiety or any symptoms of depression are high, 100%, 84%, but relatively low, comparatively low uh, substance use. Comparatively low, but still um, a 37% of them uh, uh, are above the, the alcohol or low risk guidelines. And then class one is the second in frequency, meaning low mental health concern, low uh, alcohol and substance use. Uh, class, uh, class, so, sorry, that is class one. Yes, class two is the third one. Um, and this is high, high, right? That's the, the third most prevalent class. And then the, the least prevalent class is low, high, low, mental health concerns, high, very high substance use. And this is interesting. Now we're now trying to, to figure out who are these uh, folks um, and, and what predicts, what variables predict uh, people being in, in each of these classes. So another interesting thing that we do, as, as I mentioned, uh, we, um, we report, uh, we, we, we send out the survey weekly and we find a number of people, uh, about 40% with uh, thoughts of suicide, 7% at least one life suicide, uh, lifetime suicide attempt, and about one student every two weeks with, um, with a suicidal plan and suicidal intent. And we, uh, since this is an anonymous survey, of course, we don't know who they are, but nevertheless, we offer them uh, if they consent to get them in touch with uh, a student counseling within one day and get them an appointment within one week. Um, and uh, about 50% of the students with a suicidal intent and plan uh, go through with that and, and we, we connect them with the, with the health services. So the e intervention that we're developing based on all of that information uh, we're co-developing it with students. Uh, this is uh, some work led by Melissa Brashajin, a, a, a research assistant and former UBC student in our lab. And, and basically we know that smartphones uh, and, 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 and e-mental health interventions in general work, but they have very low uptake, very low engagement. And the reason is in general that um, they're one size fits all uh, uh, tools, uh, no personalization, no interactivity, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to go the other way. And we had this uh, very, very uh, thorough process of mapping the student groups, recruiting them and, and forming a student advisory board uh, with students representing about 20, 20 organizations on campus. Um, some of them student-led, others UBC-affiliated, others specific themes like Indigenous or, or LGBT, etc. cetera. Um, um, and then we have also uh, graduate students that are studying uh, psychotherapy. We did outreach to all of those. Not all of those um, uh, finally joined our uh, student advisory board, but most did. And we've had a fantastic uh, series of meetings where they gave us, they provided the direction of what they were interested in having. And our app is called Minder. Um, and as I said, the student advisory committee, 10 students on staff, uh, synergies with existing student led projects at, at UBC. We created a, there's an intervention component, which is a chatbot, an automated chatbot that delivers CBT, a number of videos of different uh, organizational uh, 
actors that provide uh, messages, skill building, um, uh, destigmatizing messages, etc., and also uh, skills based on evidence-based uh, uh, interventions. And we also develop, based on the request of the Student Advisory Committee, a triage component, meaning uh, based on need and preference, we match students with actual brick and mortar services on campus if they want to. Um, and also a community component based on interest and, 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 and characteristics, matching them with student groups or events on campus. And we're developing those in collaboration with other groups, including uh, student government. Okay, and the RCT, we will compare the step care model uh, uh, of app utilization. So first self-guided and then based on utilization criteria, bump it up to peer uh, uh, augmented uh, app utilization, basically through messaging with a peer that we're training. Um, and then um, um, the, the, if, if outcomes do not improve, uh, a video interface for psychosocial support also with a peer. Okay, this is just what happened there. Okay, um, this is just some some of the of the visuals. We're still working on the on the final um, visual strategy, but basically this is the chatbot. It asks the student how do, do they feel, what do they want to talk about, combination of uh, um, um, selected answers and free text box for the user to to to, to respond. Uh, we have a triage uh, component, as I said and then a community component that matches with events. Okay, so basically uh, what we demonstrated is uh, the feasibility of an ongoing online screening that lets us actually know what the student concerns are with respect to mental health and substance use. Uh, we, demo we are demonstrating, we haven't finished, uh, that it is feasible to develop apps with uh, the end user involved at every step of the way. Um, and we will um, um, test that through a randomized control trial. And this allows us to develop real-time analysis and, and tailor our app to the actual needs. And there's a huge team at UBC and Harvard and McMaster, SFU and U of T. Let me see if I have something else now. Well, those are some posters, but this is, this is it. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna stop sharing now and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Vigo. Um, so if anyone has any questions, they can either, if you like, um, you know, unmute yourself and ask the question, or if you don't feel comfortable, you can put it in the uh, chat and I will read it out to Dr. Vigo as well. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, Dr. Vigo. My name is Michelle. I'm the uh, Director of Clinical Programs at the Elizabeth Fry Society in Vancouver. I'm really curious about your uh, low-high group and if you have any hypotheses about what might be going on there, what you might be seeing. Yes. Low-high group is, uh, to, to, to refresh our memories, is the group of students um, who have, this, uh, this is about... Um, um, if I remember correctly, 10, 12% of students who have uh, low mental health concerns. So basically no anxiety or depression because this is a very low threshold, uh, no anxiety or depression and very high uh, alcohol use, cannabis use and even opioid use and, um, and um, uh, non-prescription stimulant use. 30% uh, any opioid use and um, I don't remember exactly, but in the 20s, I think for non-prescription stimulant. Use. So high risk, high risk substances. Um, yes, our hypothesis, we were discussing this actually yesterday in, or the day before in our team meeting, in our quantitative analysis meeting, and our student team thought that this may be, again, this is just um, uh, a, a hypothesis. We can, we're going to try to drill uh, uh, down, but this can be, for example, student athletes, right? Uh, students, uh, students involved in sports, etc. Uh, who tend to uh, have a, a good uh, mental health outcomes, but very problematic and risky substance use, alcohol and cannabis, but also because of, of uh, sports-related injuries uh, may have been prescribed at some point without, without uh, a, a good indication. Uh, unfortunately, physicians still prescribe opiates for, for uh, the management of chronic pain, which is outrageous in, in this scenario. Um, and then again, they may not focus on study until the last minute, and therefore 
uh, use uh, stimulants diverted from someone with a prescription, PAL or PEER, et cetera. So that's, how, that's what we're gonna try to see if it, if it, if it makes sense. This is just uh, after brainstorming with, with our peers. But certainly it needs to be a group that does not have any symptoms of mental health uh, anxiety or, or depression, and nevertheless uh, uses a lot of, of alcohol, drugs, et cetera, which is very different from the, let's say the high, high group, which is people that have high mental health uh, and, uh, concerns. And therefore uh, the substances may be thought of as some form of, of self, self-medication, quote unquote, uh, because again, these are not disordered uses. These are above uses above the low risk guide. Does that make sense? Uh, does that respond to the yeah. question? Yeah, that that's that's great. I'm just also then curious. I mean, if um, did you uh, do any gender analysis on that group? Was it more prevalent males, females? We haven't done it yet. We haven't okay. Yet. Um, uh, we we had done one before. We hadn't included the stimulant use uh, in as a, as, a, as a one of the variables, um, and 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 gender was a factor. Um, I don't remember exactly in in which direction, but it was a factor. Okay. Um, um, uh, but we'll know. We'll know soon. We're going to run those those regressions uh, this week. Actually, that's great. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. There is a question in the chat uh, from Rachel, who asks: um, Were the gender items tracked only men, women? Will you include expanded gender options in the future to map out differences between men, women, transgender, diverse students? Yes. Excellent question. We did ask uh, about transgender, two-spirited, other. Just one second, let me bring this up. Uh, um, as you can see there, uh, the other group, very significant, high baseline uh, anxiety, but however, for the specific analysis, we didn't have enough numbers to, uh, to, to, to look at the uh, impact or the interaction uh, of the other with the exposure. So we know there's a, a, a very large uh, baseline anxiety, um, but we, we, we didn't see uh, or we didn't feel that our numbers allowed us for a, um, an analysis of the uh, other you know, uh, uh, gender uh, identification, but we do ask about that and we will conduct, you know, this is just a, a preliminary analysis. At that point, I think we had, when we run this, we had about 1300 uh, respondents. Um, now we have about 4,000 and, and we'll continue this. So at some point we will have enough numbers to, to, to do that. So thanks for that question. Um, and there's another question uh, from Jennifer that says, this was done with university students, which is also a unique group. Any thoughts on if this would be done in youth who did not or cannot go to university and are likely more marginalized for a, a variety of reasons? Oh yeah, that, 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 there's no, no reason why this model couldn't be replicated uh, in, with any group. Um, for example, I know that Foundry, uh, which is a, um, a, a, an integrated uh, platform of care, brick and mortar, and also digital, I, I believe, for, for, young, for young people in general, uh, they, they do a lot of work of co-development with, with youth in general. Our RAM, which is a, a project uh, led by Michael Krauss, um, uh, who, who also leads this conference, uh, is also a, a uh, so there's if no. people can can meet their, their it's parents. unlikely um, so also developing uh, digital platforms in consultation in collaboration with uh, high risk for example opioid users so this this model can and actually should be applied from my perspective uh, this co-development model should be applied with any population of course maybe students make it particularly easy because of their interest, their engagement, uh, the level uh, of, of uh, the, the first. So one thing that I expected when I started this work um, was to, to, to not find much in terms of uh, mental health um, uh, services, uh, et cetera, on campus. And I was overwhelmed by the level, quantity, quality, 
intensity of the commitment by students to, to deal with this. Of course, in a very fragmentary manner, which is our, our uh, problem here in, in BC and probably in Canada, which is that there are a gazillion initiatives happening and, and they're very poorly coordinated. And so one, one, um, one added benefit, I, I believe, I hope, of this project is bringing all of those groups together and to some extent having some integration. Yeah, so I think uh, Jillian, I think just offered um, uh, some insight to Jennifer, who says, um, we recently published a systematic review on patterns of adolescent substance use in general and in targeted samples where we summarize 70 different cluster an analyses. Uh, although adolescents, uh, we found similar patterns when mental health was included, but mental health is rarely included in cluster analyses. That's very interesting, Julia. Thank you for that. Um, would, you, would, you, would you be able or willing to say a little bit more about your study? Yeah, sure. So I'm from McMaster here. And yeah, we recently published the systematic review where we were looking at different cluster analyses of adolescent substance use. Um, we didn't uh, require them to have mental health indicators to be included in the study. They just had to have more than one substance. Um, and I think only, I'm trying to remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I think about a quarter to a third had included mental health variables in the cluster analyses. And there were kind of consistent uh, patterns where you had the linear association that we typically assume where as substance use increases, mental health often also did increase, but there were also several studies that did find the high mental health, low substance use and the low substance use, high mental health. Uh, it, now it's definitely, as you probably know, really difficult to combine and summarize uh, cluster solutions across different samples when everybody's using different variables, different populations, but uh, yeah, there was a, a, a good amount of kind of evidence pointing towards that those are the patterns that are quite consistent. So I was happy to see that you found those patterns as I was uh, hoping that that was the way of the future in terms of including mental health in these models. So we can tease apart those who can use substances and not have mental health problems versus those that do use substances and, and have mental health problems, especially in emerging adults or adolescents where we have like social use and sometimes social use is partly beneficial at this part of development to be able to make the connections. So who are those people that can use substances, not have problems versus who needs to be a bit more careful, especially during a time of high social pressure. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Jillian, for, for that. Um, there's another uh, question there about um, uh, asking that I speak more on, on the involvement of young people in the project. Uh, were they only used in the capacity of advisors or did young people, students also work directly in all stages of the project? Uh, so that, that is um, a very important uh, question. And I have to say, we started off uh, as any uh, or as many projects. Uh, I developed the, the proposal for Health Canada. Uh, that proposal involved uh, a version of the, what well, the project is now. Uh, Health Canada took several, a couple of years actually to review the, the proposal. And then when they actually funded it, uh, we had learned a lot about this uh, issue through other projects in other countries in the collaboration, in the uh, World Mental Health Service Initiative. And so I started changing things. And uh, one of the main things that I changed is Instead of, as was the proposal originally, which is take off the shelf uh, interventions and test them, um, I thought that we should actually uh, co-design the, the study with students. And so um, the students were not involved in the development of the proposal that got funded, but they were involved in the transformation of that proposal into something, into a project that, that is completely different from what it originally was. Um, they were involved as, uh, uh, as uh, student advisors in the committee. Uh, and that committee is the one that, for example, uh, uh, told us that they, they uh, found uh, chatbots 
to deliver the intervention something appealing, meaning a message, a conversational agent, a messaging like an app, right? And that's the direction we took. That Those are the ones that told us that they wanted a triage component, something to match um, the, the, the student uh, needs to the existing services and the community component, something to facilitate social uh, links within the student community. Um, those are the ones, for example, that told us that they wanted uh, uh, coaches included, peers. Uh, so we basically um, followed the direction of that student advisory committee. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is that we actually hired uh, 10 students at this point um, uh, that are on staff and leading or co-leading component. For example, the videos in the app, they decided, for example, that they wanted videos where students um, 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 explain their experiences seeking mental health services on campus, why that failed, and, and how they thought of these different components of the app. And so there's, we showed that video and it's now being edited. The students develop the scripts for the video. We have this, um, this tool where we have guides, quote unquote guides, where different uh, organizational actors, they can be uh, faculty, they can be uh, other students, they can be um, healthcare providers, and they you know, basically deliver uh, um, in a point of view manner as if they were talking to the, to the, to the user of the app, um, and they provide some skills. And for example, they developed a script for uh, our president, uh, uh, Santa Ono, to deliver uh, in terms of what, where, what, what, what is it that he sees uh, that is lacking on, on campus mental health? What are the efforts that uh, UBC, for example, is doing? What was his own experience with mental health challenges? And he read the script and delivered the video uh, uh, as, as decided by the students. So, so it, it is really a, 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 you know, a, a co-development uh, uh, process in, in, in a genuine way. So in the participatory research continuum that goes from just getting some input at some point to actually uh, uh, making decisions on the outcomes, um, we are fairly close to the most participatory uh, end of that continuum. Um, having said that, the outcomes, um, for example, have been decided in the research, within the research team, which as I said, includes 10 students uh, that, that basically lead uh, components. Laura Jones, for example, led the implementation of the, of the online survey, of the weekly online survey. Um, Julia uh, Pays, for example, uh, uh, coding uh, uh, most of the analysis. So they, they, they are really protagonists in, in, in all respects. Okay, there's, there's more questions there. Um, can you speak about how levels of anxiety and depression were measured? Yes. So we have uh, uh, our, our uh, survey, which I adapted for Canada, is a, it's called DSM-5 um, University Student Survey. It's developed by the uh, WHO World Mental Health Service Initiative based on the CD, which is a composite international diagnostic interview. Um, and so it provides a uh, um, structured uh, diagnosis based on a DSM-5 for all disorders. Now, for that analysis that I showed you, we use the CD screener, which has been uh, validated to capture uh, uh, sort of uh, it's a, it's a screener for anxiety and depression. And the ones that screen positive are then asked the uh, more specific questions uh, that provide eventually a diagnosis of an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder. So, so it's basically the CD, the Composite International Diagnostic Interview. Thank you. If anyone has any other questions before we wrap up. Actually, I have a question um, while we wait, maybe someone is typing something up. Um, I think in one of your first slides, you mentioned that um, being um, female kind of reduced um, the anxiety that was felt during the pandemic. Do you, is that, I think that that's what it was. So can you, do you have any ideas of why that was? Because usually it, you know, um, we see that women have higher anxiety uh, compared to men. So that was a very interesting finding to me. Yes. So as, as you uh, say, let me share my screen again. Um, women have increased baseline anxiety 
as you can see here, 14 percentage points more anxiety than men as a baseline. Um, and this is any anxiety, this is not anxiety disorders. The overall prevalence of any anxiety in this uh, analysis was 70%. So uh, the, the, these 14 percentage points are actually an increase in about probably 18% in the anxiety uh, uh, women with respect to men. But however, uh, if we consider the uh, effect of COVID, the overall effect of COVID in the multivariate analysis was an 11 percentage point increase. Meaning if you, if you knew someone who tested positive for COVID, regardless of your gender, you had uh, an increase of 11 percentage points, probably 15% increase in your probability of having anxiety. Now, in fact, if we interact with gender, what we see is that this 11 percentage points are probably an average of a very large effect in men um, and a, a very small effect in, in women, meaning that uh, in women, uh, there's a 20 percentage point uh, uh, less probability of increased anxiety than in men. And uh, so what that what this basically, so several explanations can, can exist here. First, uh, the most likely one is that if you already have uh, high levels of anxiety, your responsiveness, your anxious response to a shifter, to, an, to another stressor is lower than if you have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, lower baseline anxiety and your response is much higher, right? So it's basically this movement, right? And so that's one. And it's, it's, it's interesting also to, to see data that to some extent points to the resilience of, of, of females in the, in the context of such a, such a massive stressor. So that, that's my, my, my and, and again, one of the things that we want to do, because our tool allows us for real-time analysis and, you know, for example, we could, in our weekly uh, survey, we could identify, based on the responses, we can identify a group of, of females who know someone with COVID and have low levels of anxiety, and we can ask them if they would be willing to ask to answer additional questions about that, right? And we can even have a qualitative component uh, that uh, that let, lets us uh, sort of shed light on these issues. We have a, a group uh, in our team led by uh, James Gillette from McMaster uh, University, who is thinking about all of these sort of qualitative uh, follow-ups to the findings that we that we that we have seen here. So that's uh, my response to, to, to that. Thank and you, with respect, yeah. sorry, go, go ahead. Um, yeah, and then we have one more question by Dr. Hannon uh, who asked, can you speak about who initiatives in the field? Um, okay, so there are two, 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 two things here. So one thing is the WHO World Mental Health Surveys Initiative, which is a collaboration of researchers um, I belong to that collaboration. I'm the chair of the uh, mental health services work group. That is the collaboration led by Ron Kessler at, at Harvard. Um, and with respect to those initiatives, we have uh, um, the surveys, the, the CD surveys uh, in, in around at this point, 30 something countries with about 160,000 respondents. So it's the largest primary uh, um, uh, data source for, for psychiatric epidemiology globally. And with respect to the university students, uh, we have, I believe, now around 11 uh, universities or countries and an ongoing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the respondents must be now in the around 20,000 20, or, or something like that. Um, with respect to WHO as the, you know, the multilateral organization, um, well, it has, it, it has many, many um, initiatives in the field um, that, that seek to, um, to, to uh, promote or, or facilitate uh, the, the delivery of mental health and substance use services. The most notable one is the, the mental health gap, MH gap, which yes. is a, a, a way to, uh, to, to, to sort of manualize uh, the delivery of mental health and substance use services by, by primary care physicians or, or community uh, providers. Um, and I know that they are trying to, um, to come up with a more comprehensive um, e-mental health strategy in some countries, uh, particularly, I believe, for example, in Egypt, and there's also initiatives in Latin America. Anyhow, so, so, so 
WHO is, is leading or trying to lead the, the, the way in, in that respect. Thank you. Yes, I meant the e-mental health initiative. So these are in many countries, not just in limited countries. Yes, I know that we're going to have one in Egypt, so I wanted to know about the others. Thank you yes, so, so we have this, uh, the, the university student uh, projects. Uh, there are several in the US, Mexico, um, um, uh, several countries in Europe, Netherlands, um, uh, Belgium, uh, France, Spain, um, and and so and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, South Africa is is also launching one. Um, yes, and and we are very much uh, willing and interested to to support uh, initiatives um, because, as I said, this is a, a a very nimble instrument. Once it is launched, it, it is basically no 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 scale up costs. Right? Anybody who is working with children. Good question. Not in our, uh, uh, not not in in, in our group. Uh, our we focus on adults, um, and uh, but that that would be a a, a fundamental uh, aspect to to explore. But, but I'm not aware of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, okay. so um, if there isn't any more questions or. Um, I think we'll wrap up. Um, just waiting to see if anyone is typing anything or if anyone wants to unmute themselves, ask one last question before we wrap it up. Okay, all right. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Vigo. Very interesting and insightful um, you know, results in the current context that we're in on students' uh, mental health and substance use and how they're doing. So very interesting. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for participating. Um, hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you, Eva. Thanks, thanks everyone for your questions. Thanks.